Hello everyone, this is Joshua Smith of Apollo's Artifacts. It is still October of 2018, and as such, our Halloween-themed episodes are nearing an end. In this episode, we're going to take a look at the Blood Countess, or the Countess of Blood, Elizabeth Bathory. According to some historians, she is the most prolific female serial killer of all time, killing anywhere from as few as 35 people to as many as 650. She is also sometimes referred to as Countess Dracula because of her habits of supposedly bathing in and even drinking human blood. She's also a really good example as to why history can be so complex, as we'll get into later. She was a Hungarian noblewoman from a very wealthy family, and as such, she was involved in a, an arranged marriage and she was betrothed at a very early age and then later married to a Ferenc Nasdedi, a man who was also a soldier and whose nickname was the Black Knight. I wonder sometimes if character the Black Knight or Kurgan in the Highlander film was somehow based upon this character or was somehow based upon this man. Even before her supposed rampage of murders had begun. It is uh, said that she and her husband, the Black Knight, were extraordinarily brutal and cruel to their servants. And this was at a time when the threshold for brutality towards servants was already set pretty darn high. So Elizabeth Bathory, she lived from August 7th of 1560 until August 21st of 1614. Her family owned numerous castles and estates throughout Hungary. She was very well educated, she was raised as a Calvinist Protestant, and she studied and fluently spoke at least three other languages, Latin, German, and Greek. She was to have at least four legitimate children and possibly one bastard child. Her husband, the Black Knight, gave her Cactis Castle upon their marriage, however he spent much of his time at war against the Ottomans. He was renowned for being quite brutal in war, much like his predecessor Vlad the Impaler, he also impaled his enemies, sometimes he would even have them beheaded and then kick the heads around in a sort of game-like manner. He also reportedly frequently danced with the dead bodies. The Black Knight died of unknown causes in January of 1604, at the mere age of 48. However, he passed on all of his lands and his widow's care to a man named Georgi Thurzo. During the last two years of the Black Knight's life, there had been a number of complaints being raised by villagers who lived nearby and even monks who lived in monasteries nearby of horrendous sounds, screams of terror coming out of the castles where Bathory was. There were increasing suspicions that something was being done to the servants other than mere punishment. Now it is said that she was able to enact this reign of terror so long as she uh, maintained her focus on killing local um, peasant girls who seemed to have made up the overwhelming majority of her victims. However, it seems that she was unable to limit herself to them, and then she began to pick off members of the lesser nobility. She opened up a school of etiquette where many other noble women would then send their children, and then they ended up being killed as well. This, of course, raised the suspicions to a whole new level to where a real investigation finally began. However, the official investigation did not begin until 1610, so she had many, many years in which she was continuing to commit these murders. Supposedly, she had four or five assistants who were helping her to commit these murders, four women who were thought to be witches, of course, as was typical of the time, and one male who is thought to have been possibly a little person or a dwarf, per the name that they used at the time. It is thought that she was already somewhat of a psychotic person, even before she got with her husband, the Black Knight, but that their cruelty kind of worked together to really enhance her overall disposition towards other people, to where her psychopathy, perhaps, 
allowed her to uh, not care at all about what she did to other people. And especially with her noble position and all of her wealth, she was able to do this for a very long time without suspicions being raised sufficiently. Now, it is said that um, after she had opened this um, refining school and began mur murdering the members of the lesser nobility and the daughters of other wealthy families nearby, the investigations began and immediately there were nine uh, dead there were nine dead bodies found upon the first night of going into the castle. Confessions were immediately extracted from her accomplices. However, this was done under torture, which is notoriously unreliable for, get for getting good results. During the trial, hundreds of witnesses were brought forward. There were dozens of witnesses who claimed to have actually witnessed the events take place themselves. And this is also where it began to emerge these stories that she was interested in a concept that we today label parabiosis, which is the use of the blood of the young in order to try to maintain youth for another older person, whether by, of course, rubbing it on her skin, bathing in it, or indeed imbibing upon the blood itself, whereas today that would be in the form of transfusions or infusions of blood. Oddly enough, there have been a few controversial studies performed lately which seem to show that this concept of parabiosis uh, or the transfusion of blood into an older person from a younger person indeed does work, and I will link some of that below so you can check that out. However, rubbing it on your skin or bathing in it or drinking it um, certainly would not be something that would help. Also, people have raised questions about the whole idea of being able to bathe in the blood by the time you've exsanguinated the bodies and then put it into a tub, it's going to begin to congeal and that's not going to make for a particularly good bath. Now, one of the testimonies that came out at trial was from a young servant girl who claimed that another person had seen a diary of the Countess in which were recorded the names of 650 of her victims. This is where the 650 figure comes from. However, this diary has never been found. And we don't know how reliable, of course, the testimony would be from this person since it would be basically second or third hand information at best. And this is where some of the more recent attempts by historians and filmmakers have begun to sort of rehabilitate her name in ways because the investigation itself was actually carried out by Count Thurzo, who I mentioned before, was uh, given possession of the lands and, of course, to caretake over this widow. But the argument is that basically he made up a lot of these false claims because he wanted to take away her land because uh, they were very jealous about a woman of such wealth and power at this time. And since her husband had passed away, she was no longer under that sort of protection. So then that made her vulnerable to these, this sort of investigative process, which ended up taking her wealth and lands away from her and handing them over to the count. Now, the problem that I have with this is why would he wait almost some eight years before advancing this whole process. It seems that he would have been making these moves almost instantaneously upon the death of the Black Knight. At best, he would wait maybe a year or two years, but why more than a half dozen years? Other questions that I would have is how is it that there would be so many hundreds upon hundreds of witnesses who say that they heard things or saw things um, how is it that he would have influenced a monk at a local monastery to begin at first writing not to him or to local um, secular authorities, but were writing actually to the spiritual authorities who were complaining about the noises and the screams and howls of pain and terror coming from the castle? I can't see this Count Thurzo character having any involvement in that particular aspect. Another aspect is that we have lots of examples of powerful uh, female nobility who were indeed uh, single or were widows who were not targeted in such a manner and who were able to continue to reign or hold on to their lands for many, many years all the way until the end of their life and then pass it on to their heirs. So I'm not sure why we should make such a huge exception in this case to throw out the eyewitness evidence of hundreds of people uh, simply because of this idea that maybe the society was too patriarchal at the time, which perhaps it was, but that is neither here nor there as to whether or not she actually committed these heinous acts. Some of you may remember the first episode that I did this month, which was focusing on the Codex Gigas or the Devil's Bible. 
And in that episode, I mentioned a person by the name of Herman Inclusus, who was thought to be the monk who was the author of that text. Early on, it was uh, thought to be that his his name actually meant Inclusus in Latin, which was meaning one who was walled up. Actually, it ended up meaning, say, Herman the Recluse, meaning he was a reclusive monk who worked on this book for many, many years. But this uh, punishment was the punishment that was exacted upon the blood countess. She was walled up. For the last four years of her life, she was in a tower, and she was fed only through a slit. And quite naturally, one would assume that if she already had some sort of mental instability, some sort of madness that was afflicting her, this would have become much, much worse during these four years that she was walled up until, you know, basically she died from it. And her accomplices were killed in a rather brutal but much faster fashion with, I believe, the Four female so-called witches had their fingers pulled off or something like that, and I think that they were set on fire. And I believe that the uh, dwarf fellow, the little person, was beheaded or something like that, and then his body set on fire or something to that effect. But that's just the way these things were handled at that time. Now, following all of this, many of the royal elites got together, a lot of the nobility and whatnot, and what they did is they actually had many of the records of her supposed murderous deeds covered up and they had many of the records destroyed. What we have that has survived is just through happenstance alone. Out of the more than 300 witnesses who were called, who gave their testimonies, many of them said that she had actually been committing these murders not just at the one castle that was given to her by the Black Knight, but at her many other castles and estates as well and that she had been procuring victims from local villages, which basically she was considered to own, through deceptive practices, sending out other people to say, hey, come up to the castle and, uh, you know, she's going to help you with this or help you with that or teach you something or whatever else. And then they ended up uh, suffering through some uh, rather horrific things, which included being burned with hot tongs, placed in cold water, having honey poured over their bodies and uh, laid on top of ants. Um all kinds of uh, absolutely atrocious things, uh, being bitten, um, arms and body parts being cut off, uh, mutilation of their hands, uh, severe beatings, and so on, all the way up until their demise. Some even gave reports that there were uh, planned victims or future victims who were contained inside of cages that were hanging from the ceiling, much like you will find throughout the Elder Scrolls games. I think it's also quite revealing that out of all of her many servants that were called to testify, every single one of them except one testified against her as being guilty. And indeed the one who did not could have been another one of her accomplices who just wasn't caught. Her official kill count according to the court was set at 80. However, there were many, many people who testified that just during their short terms of service they saw anywhere from 36 or more people killed, others estimated they had seen more than 50, and still others said that uh, upon the removal of the bodies from some of the castles, they saw anywhere from 100 to 200 bodies brought out. And as part of the trial, many of these cadavers, body parts, and bones were examined in the court itself. Now initially, her body was actually buried on church grounds, but there were so many complaints from the local villagers of having some such a hideous person buried uh, in their cemetery so nearby that her body was actually then removed and it was taken off to the Bathory family crypt to be stored. But as of today, the actual location of her body is unknown. This is yet another similarity we have between she and Vlad the Impaler. We actually do not know where he is buried either, although there are thoughts that he had been buried in a couple of different places, but uh, none of that has ever been confirmed. I would also like to point out one more interesting tie-in that sort of links Bathory to Vlad the Impaler, which is the Bathory family coat of arms, which actually has a dragon symbol on it, which is indeed meant to be symbolic of the Order of the Dragon, which of course Vlad Dracula had drawn his name from his father being in this Order of the Dragon. Ultimately, I would say that I'm skeptical of these claims that she ever drank blood or that she bathed in blood, but I'm equally skeptical of the recent attempts among some historians and other sort of hangers-on 
to attempt to rehabilitate her image and claim that she actually was the victim of a conspiracy and uh, did not commit these murders. As far as I know, there are only one or two paintings of her that have survived until today. In fact, uh, during the trial or right after the trial, one of the penalties that was imposed by the King of Hungary, who was Matthias II, they decided that her name itself would be declared illegal and that um, anything that was bearing her name, any kind of objects or anything like that, were supposed to be confiscated and ultimately destroyed to sort of erase her from existence. Not to give Google and the big uh, far-left tech companies any more ideas as to how to unperson people. They would certainly like to do that today, I'm sure, of certain mm, people who will go unnamed for right now. With that, we'll just about close out October. I have a few special episodes that I will be releasing throughout the day on Halloween itself, perhaps even uh, All Hallows Eve as well. Please be sure to like, subscribe, hit the bell, and share. Thank you.